I'm Al Phil Reese, and this is Poem Talk at the Writer's House, where I have the pleasure of convening colleagues in the world of contemporary poetry and poetics to collaborate on usually a close but not too close reading of a poem. We talk, open up the verse to a few new possibilities, and we hope gain for poems that interest us, some new readers and listeners. And I say listeners because Poem Talk poems are available in recordings made by the poets themselves as part of our Penn Sound archive, writing.upenn.edu slash Penn Sound. As the result of a collaboration between the Kelly Writers House, Penn Sound, and the Poetry Foundation, Poem Talk episodes have been released monthly since 2007, and this is the 100th episode. So in honor of our 100th, we're changing our format this one time and are recording a retrospective of previous episodes. For that, we have convened seven poets who have been involved in Poem Talk episodes over the years, and we've asked each to reconsider two episodes and add a new or second thought, an elaboration, a revision, or a further comment. And we're doing this before a live audience here in the Arts Cafe at the Kelly Writers House in Philadelphia. And so I ask our audience to register their presence and maybe their enthusiastic anticipation of this session by putting their hands together to help me welcome our returning poem talkers as I now introduce them by name. And as I introduce them by name, you can still register your presence and your appreciation for them. Maria Damon. Well, thank you. William J. Harris. Yay. Tracy Morris. Yay. Charles Bernstein. Herman Beavers. Yeah. Erica Kaufman. And Steve McLaughlin. Thank you, you registered your presence. There will be two rounds. Each poet will recall one Poem Talk episode, offer a comment or further view, and at some point during that comment, we'll play a short clip from the episode, and once we've considered seven episodes, we'll go back for another round. And after that, I will lead a brief open discussion about what we've heard, looking for a few responses to the responses. So let's begin with Erica Kaufman, who will talk first about Poem Talk number 45 on Eileen Miles' poem, Snakes. Erica? So I wanted to begin by saying thank you to the Kelly Writers House, Al, Zach Gardner, and to Poem Talk. I'm honored to be here celebrating the 100th episode. And I'm going to be talking about Poem Talk number 45, which is on Eileen Miles' poem, Snakes. So I think a lot about three big things, poetry, pedagogy, and literacy, and technology. And when I think about Poem Talk, I think about the way it as a project engages all of these things, close to reading a poem collaboratively, while stimulating multiple kinds of literacies, which are then shared via technology, and then in turn, the collaborative close reading process continues out in the broader world. And can you play the... So we're going to play an excerpt from the episode. Uh, I don't know that does what it would... The excites me about that, though, is whatever you sat down to do when you write a poem, maybe you think you're making a demonstration or whatever, but then the poem takes over. And to me, if, if Eileen thought she was outside of this making something, she becomes totally enmeshed inside it, or the, as the voice does. So um, that's probably another way of saying she did it as an exercise, but it definitely has a place among her other works yes, because it absolutely. definitely transcends the little exercise. Sarah, you were going to say something on this? Oh, just that I completely agree. I'm all for the exercise. I'm, I'm a big advocate of the exercise. And um, yeah, this ending is so mysterious and exciting to me. Um, I like that it repeats the idea of never returning from kind of the middle of the poem, which... Um, is another sort of child moment. You had cited it a minute ago. The cake is lit. It's round. The children sing. I will never return. So I picked the excerpt that you just heard because it was a light bulb moment for me in the poem talk in terms of the way that I was thinking about the poem Snakes and also the way that I was thinking about poem talk and how... I, as a listener, was interacting with the podcast. Snakes is a poem that I find to be beautifully teachable. The way that Charles Alexander in The Moment You Just Heard describes the process of writing 
and how in this case the poem takes over. He then follows with a bit of talk about the value of the exercise or the constraints. And I also love the moment where Al says that the poem transcends the exercise and constraints. So what's interesting to me about Snake's and Miles's work more generally is the way the reader's taken over by the poem, a complex thing to think about when you're teaching the close reading, you're teaching poetry, you're teaching poetry writing, or all of the above, any combination. Hearing Miles read Snake's on the Poem Talk episode, I was taken by the familiar intonation of her voice and then found myself navigating the poem by way of the collage of the speaker's perspective combined with the speakers participating in the poem talk. It helped me to imagine how or why hearing a conversation like this would change student perception of what poetry is and what a poem can do. This is a quote from the poem. The telephone rings, it's me. Knowing that Miles wrote this as a de demonstration of an assignment she gave um, to high school students in Provincetown, the assignment was be any age in your life and go down the drain with it, is interesting in terms of what the poem talkers say. Michelle Taransky says something about the poem is modeling the things you can do. And this led me to think about modeling the things one can read and how we read, specifically poetry. So what happened for me and what I'm thinking about in my response to this poem talk is I'm thinking about teaching and I'm thinking about specifically um, multiple literacies, literacies and teaching through using audio. Um, so I began to teach poem talk and this was the episode that gave me the idea to actually begin to do that and it was because of that particular moment in the episode. Um, so I began to teach this episode in the context of first a workshop for interdisciplinary high school teachers, and then with the teacher's students themselves, so these were ninth through 12th graders. Um, what I noticed was that working with Miles's poem, Snakes, caused a couple of things to happen. The teachers realized that you can actually have fun with a poem and that you can play with teaching a poem and that it can be um, a more collaborative experience. And the students learned that, um, the, student, the students learned that poetry is better without multiple choice and that poetry is something that can actually do something. So, thank you. Thank you, Erica Kaufman. <laughs> that was great, Erica, thank you. Billy Joe Harris is going to talk about poem talk number 71 about Claude McKay's If We Must Die. Okay, um, let's see. Close enough? Okay. Um, I want to, to, oh, I guess before I do that, I want to move back and say uh, the poem, I found the, listening to the poem talks that they've been very, they've been very helpful and that they're an important sort of uh, move in, in letting po making poetry available to people. Uh, Al talks about it being close reading and it is close reading but it's also, it's also putting poems in context. And the two uh, uh, poem talks I went through, I was just so impressed about how the people responded to the material and made, and made it much clearer that they really, really are teachable poems. Um, uh, what I wanted to dr address uh, very, very quickly is the intended audience for, uh, Claude McKay's poem, If We Must uh, Die, and the form, and, and conclude very quickly about talking about form in Hughes and Langston Hughes and in Mary Baraka. So, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be very, it's going to be very quick. <laughs> um, so, what one has to know, first of all, is If We Must Die was published in 1919 in a white uh, left magazine called The Liberator. Uh, and that, of course, McKay uh, is black, which is not a, a simple statement. Uh, he's, he was born in 1889 and he died in 1948. Um, so, since there are no racial markers in the poem. 
we have to make the argument elsewhere. Interestingly, nowhere in the poem does he say that I am an African American, uh, or that uh, African Americans are being addressed in the poem. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to, to l look at a couple things that he says, since we can't really deduce it from the poem. And it's never, it's never simple. So McKay says, I have never regarded myself as a Negro poet. I have always felt that my gift of song was something bigger than the narrow limits of any people and its problems. Uh, so this is sort of like uh, a definitive uh, statement about that, it, that he is not uh, uh, at least a Negro poet. Then after, and he says a lot of things over his career about this one particular poem. Uh, in his autobiography, A Long Way From Home, published in 1937, 30, he says in response, he says in response to the red summer of 1919, when there were more than three dozen c cities involved in race riots, uh, that the poem, uh, If We Must Die, exploded out of me. So he's saying, and that, the, con the, the context is always that context. Uh, so he says that, and it sounds like this is very, a, a, much, a very much racial uh, moment. And, and then he says, and for it, the Negro people unanimously hailed me as a poet. So this is the one poet that's celebrated by, by, the, uh, by the black masses. It was the only poem he read to his fellow black uh, dining car workers. And sort of interesting, he was, he was, a, uh, he was a dining car worker. But, and you know, he didn't read his poetry, which I'm not surprised. And this is the one poem he felt was appropriate to read to his colleagues. And he read it to them, and they were very responsive. Now, at one point, so we have, so all right, so this seems like uh, it's certainly one audience, if not, the only, if not the only audience for the poem. And people have talked about what the audiences are. But one of his, one of his um, enthusiastic colleagues says, uh, why don't you read this poem before the uh, before our Marcus Garvey meeting. So, you know, uh, the only thing you have to know about Marcus Garvey, it was a black militant uh, uh, movement. And he says this interesting thing in response. I had no ambition to harangue a crowd. So he refuses to do that when we get to that sort of Baraka thing, which is to harangue a crowd. Uh, so we have, it, you know, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly uh, who is this intended audience. But what does he mean that his song was bigger than the narrow limits of any people and its problems? Is he arguing for a universalism springing from a particular condition? To be honest, I don't know. It would be useful to compare County Cullen and and, and Claude McKay. And what's happening there is McKay has been presented as the black militant sort of writer, the, you know, uh, out of, and McKay has been considered the sort of integrationist, to use that sort of language. Okay, let's talk about, so nothing is resolved. I could pretend it is, but it's not. It's just like, it seems like he has shifting positions on it and that he's not exactly clear. Okay, let's look at form for a, a couple minutes. Uh, the form of the poem, it is an English sonnet. And this is not surprising since he's from Jamaica and, and his tradition is, is an English tradition. Uh, uh, interestingly, later in his life, when he looks back on, on this poem and his writing, he says, and it seems like with a certain amount of regret, that he conceived of himself as a little black Brit. So it means uh, growing up in Jamaica, growing up uh, in, in British colonies, also French colonies, uh, what did they do? They tried to remake you into the shape of the, of, of the colony. So there's regret when he's, when he's writing about that. 
But I realized, okay, when I first read the poem, oh, oh, of course, the other thing is, but I gotta watch it because I say a course too many times, it'll be two hours. <laughs> uh, uh, County Cullen is also writing sonnets, and I think it'd be something really interesting to compare those sonnets, those, those two different um, uh, sonnets of these two black writers and their supposed different positioning. Uh, when I first read the poem, to be honest, in the 1960s, I found it fairly antique. And at first I thought it was a matter, it was a sonnet, but it was much more a, a matter of the diction. And just one quick line from it is, um, you know, part of the revolt, and it is a poem of revolt, says, O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. So it's this very, you know, it is not a, it is not a 20th century poem. Uh, and so as I said, I found it archaic. And I realized, in part, this is the 60s. I'm comparing it to Hughes and Hughes's blues and jazz poems and Baraka's harangues, of Mary Baraka's grave, who's a radical poet of the 1960s. Um, something that Herman Beaver, uh, Beavers points out um, in the poem talk episode, um, the jazz poem hadn't been invented in 1919. Uh, <laughs> Hughes invented it several years later. And you see all these jazz poems and, and blues poems. So I'm asking for him to work in a tradition uh, which hasn't quite been worked out, which hasn't been discovered. Uh, but what I want to say about this, which I find interesting, I'm going to bring up, and I, I swear quickly, uh, we talk about that 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 uh, McKay is working out of a of a white tradition, and he's quite self-conscious of it. But both Hughes and Baraka draw on a white tradition also. Uh, and what happens is you can call in terms of Hughes, he he drew on the tradition of. Um, of modernism, and he's and Hughes is much more a modernist poet than people give him credit for. Uh, he draws on that tradition, and that tradition, writing modernist free verse, allows him uh, uh, to write in the black vernacular and to work in jazz forms, or at least gives him the room to do it, uh, which you don't have. Well, I think some people can bring it in the sonnet. Uh, Okay, uh, so you have that, and Baraka, and uh, was working in a modernist uh, tradition also, but it's of the post-war WW2 uh, avant-garde, the new American poetry. And there, this tradition allows him uh, to write in the black vernacular, to write in this, this militant um, free verse. And one thing, the poem Black Art, which he's famous and notorious for, uh, you could call this is an act of black dada expressing anger of young milit of the young militant generation. But I want to say before we stop there, the Baraka story is more complicated. I'm sure the Hughes story is also actually Hughes story too because they both involve the influence, the important influence of black music. Uh, uh, but one uh, quick phrase about Baraka. Baraka is very much in fr involved in free jazz, and that is, which took me years to really realize, is of equal importance to the modernist to the modernist tradition. I want to do one uh, uh, quick thing back on if we must die. If we must die, uh, I rejected it earlier, and today, I rather like it. I think it's a good poem. And I think what has happened is I've gotten over sort of my modernist um, preoccupations or prejudice and, and try to take it on its own terms. Uh, gee, but I want to say one thing here. It's not written. Interesting. Uh, which is, but you, we can talk about the importance of modernism, but we can also talk about sort of like the importance of Whitman. And Hughes writes about that uh, very self-consciously. Uh, I mean, very, he declares it in poems. But there, we have the American poet trying to write the democratic poem, which is a multi, 
ethnic poem and well, let's just call it a multi-ethnic poem. And this is a poem that American poets, and also Latin America, a poet, uh, that both American and Latin American poets have drawn on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're going to play the clip, well, I mean, I the clip from I, the poem I agree talk. With everyone, oh, that sure. the historical okay. context of the poem matters, and, and therefore we read it as um, African American subjects that he's speaking to, um, and particularly African American men. Right? Um, I think this is very much a poem in response to African American soldiers coming back from World War One. Um, on one hand, and at the same time, get, trying to galvanize communities of African Americans who are experiencing death blows across the country. But what I think is fascinating about the poem is the ambiguity of who he's addressing. And I think there's a lot of debate about the racial specificity on one hand and then the appeal to universality on the other hand. But I think by having it ambiguous, I think he's making a, a kind of different citizenship claim. I think he's... Great, thank you. Again, Billy Joe Harris on Claude McKay. So now... We turn to Charles Bernstein, who's uh, thinking about poem talk number 93, a relatively recent poem talk on Helen Adams' amazing song poem, Cheerless Junkies Song. Charles. One of the things that interests me about poem talk as a, a format for a radio is that, it, and very much along the lines of the video clips that you can get on YouTube of the modern and contemporary poetry, um, MOOC that Al and friends uh, put together is that it gives uh, people a chance to hear lively discussions about poetry. Uh, in the MOOC, it's often uh, people who are students who are not necessarily experts or, or deeply invested, who just heard a talk by a leading scholar of the material he was talking about, uh, but, and so, so it's enormously illuminating. And sometimes, actually, the people who are newer to the material or don't have that depth uh, allow in uh, Listeners who are more like those those people is something I had a, a while t to to deal with because as college professors and people sort of deeply familiar with what we're talking about, but in classes we're always dealing with people who, for whom everything is in, in, in entirely new, uh, as far as the the history of the American poetry goes. And I think by uh, having a radio show in which you have people coming at it new as well as old hands, it allows new readers an opportunity to get oriented toward thinking and thinking aloud about uh, poetry, because it isn't a question of a right interpretation or a wrong interpretation, but rather thinking about the issues that um, come to the fore. Uh, so I had one short clip that I picked from the Helen Adam discussion. We're at a point now where uh, so much of what we would count as, as radical or alternative or avant-garde poetry is actually now, we look back and that now seems dominant, or that's what people pay attention to. So if I think of that, if I think of her in terms of um, reading alongside any of the people in, in Ron Mann's film, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem avant-garde, it seems of a piece. Uh, if I think of her as reading at the same time as, say, John Hollander, then, then maybe yeah, it yes. does. Yeah, yeah yes. maybe it does. But even, but even he, Hollander is interested in the same sorts of forms as well. So that's Richard Deming, who teaches at Yale, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, speaking also of a poet who taught at Yale for a long time, John Holland, who's interested in traditional form, about Helen Adams' uh, work. Helen Adam in the Fearless Junkie Song and others uses traditional Scottish ballads uh, uh, in the case of the Fearless Junkie Song, which I saw her perform at St. Mark's. It was, it was great. Uh, she's singing. Um, about roaches and LSD and a kind of send-up of hippies, but with a v very traditional ballad form. Uh, so the content clashes, and in the other work, uh, uh, some of the content uh, seems, seems to be closer to the Scottish ballad form. Richard is asking uh, something similar to what Billy uh, Joe has just said, that when we have these traditional forms, they seem anachronistic once you have the breakthroughs of uh, radical modernism and uh, the new American poetry and the process orientation, which isn't so in, involved. Um, and uh, I would say uh, 
in respect to what uh, Billy Joe is saying about if we must die, it's, I, I, I find that poem incredibly powerful and insurrectionary. I think it's one of the most insurrectionary poems of its period. And uh, I think of Claude McKay as being among the most radical uh, poets of, of that period, uh, m much more so than County Cullen, for example. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm particularly obsessed with McKay's earlier work, the Constab Ballads, which is the police ballads, where the police really become uh, a, a screen against which he uses traditional English metrical uh, tetrameter, really, in, in those cases, it's probably iambic tetrameter, with dialect, which is then a noted. So when he moves to what seems to be a, a, a seamless uh, sonnet form, the explosiveness of the contrast, now this is brought up by Herman and others in that poem talk, uh, it, it is enormously powerful in the way that it explodes what one thinks of a sonnet as being. So in addition to not having jazz poetry in 1919, one didn't have this use of form against itself, not contemplative, not a dress of a lover to a loved, but rather the constraint of the form itself smashing against if we must die, let it not be like dogs. I can't remember. Hogs. 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 Uh, and uh, each rhyme is, is cacophonous. So actually, I think it suggests aspects of a kind of noise uh, music that uh, is very powerful in its, in its contrast. Now, many, many people, of course, have said this about the McKay. I want to put Helen Adam in the same light, though. This is a poet who, 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 who's working in the 60s and, and 70s. If you think the radical revolution of modernism or of the post-war poetry has to do with open form, I think it's necessary to think again. It has to do with challenging accepted uses of form. So when Helen Adam comes into a community that celebrates, as the one in the San Francisco Renaissance, Robert Duncan et al., open form and serial form, and she uses what is a closed form, but she completely transforms the meaning of those ballads so that she makes uh, the blood, the visceral blood of the attacks on women, on blacks in, in some of those poems, uh, come on your hands and in your eyes. You see that she's reaching deep into the musical history of uh, verse in the English language and turning it inside out and ripping it apart. And it's hard for me not to see that as, as radical as any other poet of its time. Charles Bernstein, thank you. We're going to turn next to Tracy Morris, but before we do, uh, at the end of every poem talk, we have a session of Gathering Paradise. Today, we won't do that. We won't go around eight times and gather some paradise. Instead, every, every so often, I'm going to intrude with the host's prerogative of gathering some paradise from 100, 100 uh, uh, episodes. So here's one. Zach, this is, in a minute, you're going to play the clip from episode four. On episode four, uh, we are considering Allen Ginsberg's singing of William Blake's Garden of Love. And it was a very good, uh, uh, it was a very good discussion. Uh, but it was a lot more hilarious a discussion than emerged in the edited final version that Steve McLaughlin edited. So Steve, I think without telling me, or maybe you, you came up with the idea, I don't know, actually. I don't know. But anyway, Steve put in at the end the only outtake, the only blooper in all 100 episodes <laughs> of the group of us, Jessica Lowenthal, Charles Bernstein, Rachel Blau Duplessis, and me, and maybe even Steve, who was recording it, singing The Garden of Love with Ginsburg in the background. And we will now hear the clip of that blooper outtake. And everybody needs to sing along like oh, boy. You I really mean, were annoying hard. during this. <laughs> you saw You'll what I Charles. never had seen. Alan used to make people sing along, too. Hit it, Zach. This is Al Filbert's, and I hope you'll join us again soon for another Poem Talk. Chapel was built in the mist Where I used to play on the green and, and the gates, the gates of, of this the chapel, chapel were shut. And thou shalt not rip <laughs> over the door. <laughs> so I turned to the, the garden of love, love that so, so many sweet flowers bore. <laughs> and I saw it was filled with graves. 
and tombstones where flowers should be. <laughs> and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds, binding with briars my joys and desires. <laughs> Those priests are still doing it. <laughs> All those priests. Tracy Morris is uh, looking back at Poem Talk 89, a uh, me very memorable Poem Talk uh, for me, about Nathaniel Mackey's Day After Day of the Dead. Tracy. Well, you want to get real close to that mic? Uh, I can speak up. I can't. I, Gra uh, just grab it. Watch the, mm -hmm. see, this is what I was trying to avoid. <laughs> Steve, still on the job, man. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Do you mind grabbing it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, really? Uh, It'll help Zach okay. later. Okay. Never mind. I'm you so don't glad Steve's closest. You don't have to. You know, closer. Okay. Or not closest, close. Uh, anyway. Um, so congratulations Tracy. at all Thank on 100. You. Getting thank the 100, you. that means Th that you go into syndication. By the way, no, no. <laughs> oh, that would be cool. Um, thank you for coming all this way to you and others who came such oh, a long way. Happy well, you're to. One of our favorite poem talkers. Oh, no pressure. <laughs> um, I forgot this was a live audience, so I'm even more nervous now than usual. But it's an ongoing struggle. Uh, we can start with the excerpt, Zach. This feels very African in its intimacy with the dead, that the dead are not far away. They're right with us here, and that they're um, uh, uh, among us in a way that we could sit down to a meal with them. And Thanks. Uh, one of the great things about poem talk, besides general awesomeness, is, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is um, getting to encounter people that I haven't met before, like Titsi and, uh, and uh, Brilliant. And a lot of times, her in particular, when I'd hear her talk, it'd be something that I was either thinking or something that I had written, writing while I was listening to her. I was just like, get out of my head. Uh, but it was so, anyway, very interesting, uh, as you said. Um, I was torn between talking about that clip and also talking about something you said. But then I thought that would make you feel awkward. So I just decided to wait till later to Are you mention looking it. at me or Herman? I'm looking at you, Mr. Oh. Phillips. Oh, what did I say? Um, well, I'll get to it okay. in a second. Um, because I thought it was a, a noteworthy point. And I'll, uh, but first, I want to go back to what uh, Titi said about the familiarity and the intimacy with the dead. And intimacy is a word that she used a lot. Um, the title, uh, Day After Day of the Dead, references, I think, something that I talked about in one of the poem talks that I was, uh, had the honor to be in with Will Alexander. And that is, how do we perceive of Africa and Africanness? And the day of the day after, the day after day of the dead is dealing with the circumstances of African America, which everybody talked about, including um, Herman in the Middle Passage. But it's talking about a notion of Africanness that precedes white trauma, right? And it references, to me, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Mm. And you know, I don't think this is a new idea, but I want to bring this back to the notion that Titi's talking about, about Pan-African familiarity with the dead and that having a different kind of dynamic that is not predicated on trauma. Um, so I wanted to assert that. Uh, there was a poem, and I, can't, I couldn't find the line in time, uh, in Paul Beatty's, uh, one of Paul Beatty's poetry books, his early poetry books, where he was critical of one of the famous films of, you know, black Twitter, probably black cognizant, which is Brother from Another Planet. Mm -hmm. And he critiqued the film because he, uh, in this poem, and he said, no, we were only slaves on Earth. Like, don't put us, don't make us slaves in outer space, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and he said, just here on Earth, right? Um, so I just keep... Uh, a lot of these things occur to me, of course, because Nathaniel Mackey is, is illusory, illusory, illusory. Um, but I wanted to think, uh, add to that by sort of inserting this idea of the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead in the context in which Titi's talking about it, and in just in the title, him reclaiming Egypt for Africa and not equivocating on the Afrocentricity of ancient Egypt. 
Um, I also wanted to mention her comment in the context of, the, of going home, home going, and these kind of tr transatlantic connections that aren't, again, uh, re that aren't predicated on white trauma, but sort of rise above it. And that, um, and I don't want to say black trauma, I want to talk about the perpetuators of the trauma <laughs> instead of, mm -hmm. you know, of, of the people who are embodying and absorbing the trauma. Um, and there was, in this film, Daughters of the Dust, which I had a very, very small role in as the crew grunt, uh, but there was this, it was this notion, this, it talked about the myth of Evo Landing, it being an Evo Landing, and a, a long-standing story about Africans going home, and Africans going across water, Africans flying, all of this desire to return to Africa. And this intimacy and familiarity with Africa is a very long-standing trope in African-American culture, African-American poetics, song and everything, um, writing, literature, everything, everything. And so this notion, I think that he's talking about freedom as well as slavery. I think he's talking about um, the release of trauma and, pre and times before trauma that have been romanticized and epitomized and sort of made a legend in the black imagination as well as um, the, the, negotiate, the negotiation of the circumstances people find themselves in after um, you know, 1616 in the United States. 1619. Um, so this ancestral connection is not fantasist. It's practical and it's old. Um, I thought about his use of language also in this, this you know, extraordinary use of space. Uh, I think you made a distinction between silence and utterance, mm -hmm. Al, but yeah. he, uh, and Mackey does a lot of stuff with space, with the removal of words and space, and I think outer space as well as mm -hmm other kinds of space. So I, that made that prompted, for me, the way that um, in Beloved, Toni Morrison, before Beloved reemerges, has this completely, completely different relationship to language, because other kinds of beings don't have to speak in grammatical English. Mm. And, and I think that Mackie's talking about that, too. Uh, just a couple of other small points, because we go on and on. The, one of the points that you made at the very beginning is you said, who is we? And of course, I immediately thought of the Oscar Brown song, poem, genius line. He's like, what you mean we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the ellipses, I'll leave the ellipses. Uh, what you mean we white man, he said in this sort of uh, fantasy of what Tonto would say in these stereotypical films. Yeah. So it's what is, who's we? I think that he's actually adding that as a question when he uses that pronoun. Um, but I also think, because of his relationship to language and Mackie's brilliance, that he's also saying we in French. I, you know, I think he's using a, the French homophone there. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a note um, in an article about Mackie <coughs> that I should cite, but I'm not. Uh, I should cite more specifically. Uh, but the quote I like, so I grabbed the quote, and it said, from his use of sound to his concept of seriality, and his relation to theme, Mackie posits a poetics of radical musicality in which the poem is perhaps best described as an irresolvable process of root work to invoke Mackie's description of his own invocation of opera in his novel, Jot Baghotsu's Run. Excuse me for my pronunciation. So, Mackey's self-identification as root work and this connection to radical musicality, um, I'm saying that this is the kind of black magic that CT is talking about. And it's also a, notion, a relationship to ancestry, the dead, and escape. Um, root work meaning the underground root as well as roots being naturally underground. Um, so Titi's mention of Mackey's line um, in another poem, uh, in um, the... Um, and another poem says, uh, references the line, burying our head in Erzule's loin musk. And that that is actually a reference to another, I think, experimental artist, not just Haitian Wa and uh, black culture, black belief, but Maya Darren's particular reference to it as an experimental filmmaker in Divine yeah. Horseman. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's, just to close out the comments on this, there was a, a line in Song of Andumbulu, uh, which is a 55, uh, number 55 in that series. And he says, love in hell was a voice 
to be spoken to from behind. There's a way in which you say, uh, so to me that's, there's a way in which you say and don't say what you're saying something when you talk about that. And that's what root work too. It's like how you actually say something without saying something so that you can describe a thing without invoking the thing. And so there's an intimacy with that, but also sort of an understanding of what the parameters are, that you're not in that space, you are just near it. Thank you, Tracy Morris. I think all of us are scribbling notes about things we'll say in response to each other when we open the thing wide up. And I've got all kinds of things to say in response to that. And thanks for listening so carefully to that poem talk, one of my favorites. We now turn to Steve McLaughlin, who goes all the way back to poem talk number 17, when the form was still creaky and young, Steve. And um, insofar as it was made less creaky, it was owing to you. The person sitting to my right, Steve McLaughlin, was essentially the founder of this thing and figured out how to create the form and edited, recorded most, and edited all of the first 75 episodes of Poem Talk, Steve McLaughlin, <laughs> who also gets credit for coming the furthest. He came from Austin, Texas for this. Um, and he's going to be talking uh, about Rodrigo Toscano's, uh, or our Poem Talk about Rodrigo Toscano's uh, kind of odd comic poem, a poem that Rodrigo doesn't love that much, actually, he told me later. It's called Poetics. Steve McLaughlin. Thanks, Al. Um, right, so this was uh, from episode 17 of Poem Talk, um, and the poem was recorded in Buffalo in November uh, 2001, right after 9-11. Uh, it's a really fantastic poem, and it's worth looking up, I think, regardless of what uh, Toscano thinks. Uh, so the premise of the poem, just to set it up, uh, is we're looking at a kind of cross-political um, jazz jam session. Um, uh, Pyongyang, uh, the name of the city, is mentioned over and over again. Um, there's a, a Quetzal Quattle that pops up in the middle. Um, and I'm just going to read the last few lines. Uh, and Thatcher, as guest jaw harp soloist, the EU's formative contradictions unresolved? Some kill in the cut. You got the mic, Pomo Momo. Make a hoe yourself, and Maggie, and us. Um, so, okay, going into this episode, Al had a you know, really crisp, well-defined, uh, metapoetic reading uh, on this, <laughs> as he is, uh, you know, as he does. Uh, and that was, it was it, it's really good. It, it, that was exactly opposed to Randall Couch's uh, interpretation of the, the sort of the, the politics of the poem. And uh, by the end of the episode, Lynn Din, uh, who was another one of the guests, uh, just wasn't having any of it. Um, so I'm going to play two comments strung together. Uh, there's an edit in the middle you can hear. So go for it, Zach. Um, well, okay. I'm, I'm going to be kind of contrarian and, and throw well, this that's, out. That's, <laughs> okay. why, that's why we missed you all this month. <laughs> because uh, um, this poem, I think, is is, the, is meant for the poetry community. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's for a certain sophisticated audience. It's not meant for the, for your average reader. Uh, and it's interesting that, that uh, Rodrigo is, is a union organizer. He has very direct experience with common people. But yet, his poetry is 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 meant for a very specific audience, and there's something I would say that is decadent about this poem, you know, because it's exclusive and it's elitist, you know. It's hard it's hard to be critical of each other because we we, we it's such a small community. I mean, I know Rodrigo and I respect him, I admire him. But you can't demand someone to be something other than who he is. You know, I mean, you know, what I'm saying people do what they need to do. You can't say well, you got to be a different poet. I'm not trying to say that at all, but I I'm. I, I'm doubting the whole, uh, the whole worth of what we're doing, in a, in a sense, you know, in a very severe way, because I, I just feel like we're becoming increasingly irrelevant. Okay. Uh, so yeah, Lyndon, always, <laughs> always provocative. Um, <laughs> so that really struck me at the time. I knew I would go right for that when I uh, when Al asked me to, to come here. Um, so first of all, I'd say, okay. So if you're not, you know, periodically questioning the the fundamental value of poetry. Um, or, or this particular kind of poetry, uh, you're, you're probably not my kind of poet, uh, which, is, uh, which is to say I admire that. I like the, 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 how deep he goes with that. Uh, and especially at the time this was recorded, I was, I was wondering what's the point a lot. Um, I, I had, had a moment of uh, avant-garde doubt, which comes and goes, and I, I, I had to work through it, and, and I did, and I, it did come around, and I, I, think, I think I disagree uh, respectfully with uh, Lynn's argument here. Um, so just a sidebar, I think it's worth noting that the, the the respect for, for Toscano and the choices uh, that he makes in his poetry. 
um, uh, Din makes his critique in strong terms, but he isn't strident, at least not here. Um, he, he doesn't say, you know, write like I write, or I will decry your existence and, and shun you socially, and so on. Um, there's room in his, his position for uh, multiple poetics, uh, poetics uh, plural, whatever that would be. Uh, there's a, a generosity in that, I think that's really useful. Um, but over the years, anyway, as I've done poetry and, and seen and heard a lot of poetry and hosted a series and so on, I've come to see that uh, whatever kind, every kind of poetry uh, it, uh, is, is political, um, if, if only on a, 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 another level. I'm, I'm including work here with overt geopolitical content, which is great, which this poem has, uh, even if it's obliquely presented. Um, but I'm also including the you know, jangly, confusing, uh, ambiguous, uh, even apparently regressive poetry. I think there's a value, a political value, in the, the practice of what we're doing here, face-to-face, um, -face and what we'll do after, this, uh, after our presentations. You know, from my perspective, there's a, an intrinsic value in uh, just creating these networks, these social bonds, um, developing a deep solidarity, not just um, operating socially on the level of uh, likes and faves. Um, listening, reciprocating, um, showing people that you value them, being inclusive in that way. Um, just, even just having conversations off the digital record, is, is, I think, is very powerful. Um, and there's a, there's a line in Charles Bernstein's uh, new book, uh, which compares the value of poetry to the value of a bowling league. Uh, and I think, that's, I think that's exactly right. Uh, that's political too, that, those, those connections. Uh, that's really what you know, civil society is made up of. Thank Steve you. McLaughlin, that's fantastic. I know that Rodrigo is going to listen to this, so I just want to clarify. He doesn't dislike the poem. He just thought it was a kind of comic, quickie, quickie one-off. And there's so much else he's doing. So he didn't dislike the choice. He just thought it was kind of an odd choice. So, um, Well, so now uh, here's one of my little gathering paradises before we turn to Herman Beavers. Uh, in episode 44, I have a confession to make. In episode 44, it's a discussion with Lisa Robertson, Bob Perlman, and Jeff Dirksen. And Lisa and, and, uh, uh, and Jeff had come from way over on the other coast and up north. Uh, it was a long, long trip. Uh, and we were talking about a poem by Fred Waugh called Race to Go from his book Isadore. Uh, and in the middle of the discussion in my office on the third floor here, we're in the middle of talking about this thing, and it only happened once. Only once in the, in the hundred poem talks did the poet show up. I mean, you're, the poet is not welcome in these discussions, right? I mean, the poet is, I mean, we deliberately set these up so there's never, a, even when I'm all excited about an eminence is, is coming to the right, you know, Jerry Rothenberg is coming, and why shouldn't we have Jerry talk about a Jerry? No, we have a rule, you don't. In the middle of this discussion, Fred Waugh comes up the stairs. In the writer's house, he too coming a long way. What's he doing there? And he joins for the second half of episode 44. I'm here to admit that the whole thing was a setup uh, <laughs> that, that we were having. That was the conference north of invention. Fred was here. They were all here. And I had said during a break in the conference, we're going to go upstairs and do a poem talk. Would you happen to walk in in the middle of it? And he did. And so there you go. There's my confession. I, I, yeah, I ruined it. I can ruin a whole lot of others, but <laughs> um, so now Herman Beavers, uh, my dear friend, sitting to my left, uh, is going to be. Uh, but, but I'm where you are on the left, Herman. You just happen to be sitting to my left tonight. Um, uh, poem talk number seventy-eight. His, the first of his two is a very interesting choice. Muriel Rukeyser's political poem, "Ballad of Orange and Grape." Herman Beavers. Thank you, Al. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So, so Zach, could you play the clip? Amy, what are your thoughts about this crisis? Where do you think she's going? I actually, I'm sorry, I disagree with everyone. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think it's a crisis. I think the end is um, not just even a resistance. It's actually um, a kind of a, a self-reflexive call to question those binaries because I believe that Ruckheiser historically has an issue with sis closed systems. I mean, we, all, we know that she was very involved with poetry. We know that she was very interested in, in science and documentary, of course. Um, she co carried on a correspondence with Einstein. Um, so I think for Ruckheiser, the, the final gesture is actually self-reflexive to, to say, I'm not indifferent to this. I'm actually challenging these binaries. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm 
going to be a little bit autobiographical. Um, I think everybody has to some extent, but I'm, but I'm, I'm going to um, go back to um, 1978 and then 1981, and then I'm going to talk about the poem. In 1978, I was uh, one of two black students in Introduction to Creative Writing at Oberlin College. And one of the books that uh, we were assigned for the class was The New Naked Poetry, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which had just come out uh, the year before, I think. And um, black nationalist that I was at the time, um, with a huge afro um, and an attitude to match, um, I asked um, the uh, recitation group leader of my, of my group, like, how can we not read any black poets? And she said, um, in a way that was <laughs> smug and um, like, how dare you, you little snot. Um, she said, well, we are reading black poets. We're reading Etheridge Knight, who was, who was the only black poet in the New Naked Poetry. Now, if you know the Naked Poetry, which was the, the volume that the New Naked Poetry revised, um, in the volume, um, Berg and Meese say, well, you know, the next time we do this, we'll have black poets in here, so we'll have Baraka, we'll have Michael Harper, we'll have Robert Hayden, we'll have, we'll have poets of color in this book. Didn't happen. So Etheridge Knight is the only black poet in the book. So they reneged on their, on their promise. Um, but my, my point is that at the time that I took this class, I was really wary of, of taking a creative writing class. And a friend, this friend of mine and I that, that took it, we said, well, we're going we're gonna to take it together and see you know, just how badly the white folks want to mess us up <laughs> as writers. So um, one of the things that I came to really like about the New Naked Poetry is one, um, Galway Cannell is, is, is in there. And he has a connection to, to, to Etheridge Knight. Um, in fact, there's a poem in the New Naked Poetry in Knight's section dedicated to Galway Canal. And the second thing is Muriel Rukeyser is, is, is in the book. And as I'm reading her, her biography, it's clear that she's one of these poets from the 1930s, 1940s, who has a long history involved with union organizing and on the left. And, and, and I, I have to sort of take a different posture. Jump to 1981. I'm talking to um, my uh, mentor, uh, the poet Michael S. Harper, and I'm saying, man, you know, I don't know, man. Um, you know, these white authors, I just, can't, I just can't do nothing with them. And Harper says to me, um, in a week that, that uh, he, he literally, figuratively beat me within an inch of my life, um, in a, a um, he was an artist in residence at Oberlin, and, and, and he was leading this class. And, and I had no idea what a Petrarchan sonnet was. And um, I decided, well, what do I need to know about a Petrarchan sonnet? He, he made me get up out of the class at that moment and go to the library and find out what a Petrarchan sonnet was. Well, we're talking, and he's like, look, man, you got to get past the race thing. You're going to stunt your growth as a writer. You, pro you probably already have. <laughs> and. Um, it sort of struck a chord with me. So I, I say all that to say that I selected the Rukeyser poem, which I did not, actually, I was not familiar with this poem. But when I, when I, when I read it and when I listened to the, to the episode, one of the things that, that struck me was, uh, one, what a long journey I've made that I, that I selected that poem. But, but, but that would be just self-congratulatory, and that's not what I mean. Um, what, what I think is the case is that um, this is, Rukeyser's poem is the perfect poem to read in the age of Black Lives Matter. <laughs> and, and here's why I'm saying that. Um, the, the quote talks about the fact that she's resisting the idea of binaries, and she's, she's actually not operating within the space of crisis. That, that part of what she's doing is self-reflexive. I really, I really vibe with that for a couple reasons. One, um, I do a lot of work with, with chaos theory. And, and one of the things about chaos theory is that people talk about open and closed systems. Closed systems um, generally um, end in entropy, 
and randomness. And so Rukeyser's resistance to closed systems means that she's always invested in the idea of possibility. Um, when I read the poem, and we get to the, to the very end, and she's, she's sort of talking about um, the idea of pouring the, the orange bug juice into the grape container and the grape bug juice into the orange container. Part of what, in East Harlem of all places, part of what I realized, the sort of epiphany I had was, this is really what Black Lives Matter is trying to say, which is um, the powers that be don't value black bodies enough to follow the protocols that other people expect is common sense and is common occurrence. And Black Lives Matter is calling our attention to all of those moments. So some of you may know that the organizers of Black Lives Matter um, were here on campus two weeks ago for the MLK lecture on social justice. And one of the things that they said was, it resonates with this poem, is Black Lives Matter is not just about police brutality and, and the excessive use of force. It's also about Flint, Michigan. It's also about um, the fact that um, Black communities are built near um, places where there is environmental racism taking place. It's about all of that. And Rukeyser's poem, um, as a poem that I read as a, as a, that, that's not coming out of crisis about her racial identity, um, is a real important um, cosign of, of Black Lives Matter. Because part of what she's saying is, don't black people deserve to be able to trust that if they, if, they, if they say that they want orange bug juice that it's gonna come out of the orange container, don't they have the right to, to expect that? Um, and, and the fact that she uses that as, as a moment of, of, of self-reflexiveness I think is really important. Here's the other thing, um, and, and this goes back to what I was saying in terms of my autobiographical um, sort of reflection. One of the things that um, poem talk um, makes me appreciate on, on any number of levels is that it's so wide ranging in the selections that it makes for poems to talk about. Right? So, so we can go from a very traditional poem like McKay's If We Must Die, but we can also go to an extremely experimental work where you literally can't figure out what's going on on the page until you sort of really sit down and bear down on it. And poem talk is an opportunity to talk about both those things. One of the things about Muriel Rukeyser that I found out after I took this class was that a very young Alice Walker in 1967 mm -hmm. um, had found out that she was pregnant and was going to get an illegal abortion. And she writes these poems that became her first book. Um, and she slides them, because she's a student at Sarah Lawrence College, she slides them under Muriel Rukeyser's door mm. at Sarah Lawrence. Mm. And I think that connection that Walker chose Rukeyser as the one to entrust these poems written in a moment of great duress speaks to the power of several things. One, the idea that a white poet would reflect on her place in this moment at this time where this thing is happening that's so clearly about the dismissal of human life, that she would deal with it not in a crisis manner, but would say, you know, the, the thing is, every human being deserves for language to work the way that we expect it to work, that we can't be sloppy with the idea of language. And at that level, um, Rukeyser is somebody that I really embrace. This poem, um, in a very short time, has become very important to me, in large part because Rukeyser did not have to write this poem. She did not have to do it. Her, her, her reputation was well established. But that she chose to write this poem gives me faith that in this moment where I am waiting for white people to step up, and really challenge the idea of white privilege and really challenge some of the conservative constructions that come out of the, the response to Black Lives Matter. This poem says that that can happen. And um, at that level, it is a tremendous leap of faith for, for her to make, but also for us in reading it, for us to make. And 
Um, so thank you. Herman Beavers. Thank you, Herm. Thank you very much, Herm. Uh, we turn to Maria Damon, who's looking at poem talk number 43, an amazing poem and a performance by John Wieners, and the poem is called The Acts of Youth. Maria. Thank you. Thank um, you for coming today. Oh, listen, it's, it's great to my see you. pleasure, and I'm so happy to be here and very honored to be with this panel. Um, and I adore Wieners, and one of the things I adore about him is his voice. And even though there was a great deal of conversation in this poem talk about his performance, and even uh, Gary Barwin, um, who I know on Facebook as Moribund Face Fetch, yeah. <laughs> quite delightfully, um, even like set, uh, set the reading to a drum machine in which he demonstrated <laughs> that every line had about four beats, even though the reading feels very irregular. Um, so there was a lot of attention to the reading, um, but there wasn't a lot of attention to Wiener's voice, which I'm invested in because, um, because of his Boston accent. <laughs> it's very nostalgic for me. Uh, I grew up there, um, but for other reasons as well. So I'd like to start with listening to the clip, and I'm, you know, I have to say I wish I'd played a little bit more of, of, or indicated a little bit longer of a clip, because at one point he says something about a man. Yeah, man. Man, a man. And it reminds me of a reading Charles gave a number of years ago at MLA, in which he was, he was sort of over in New Yorking a Louis, and Yiddishizing, Yiddish accentizing a Louis Zukovsky poem. Foy last bothers me. Yeah. I got in a, tell you. In a very, in a very comical way. Um, so if we could just listen to John Wiener's voice. With great fear and have at the middle of night, what wrecks of mind await, what drugs to dull the senses, what little there is left, what more may be taken away. Fear of traveling future without hope or buoy. I must get away from this place. See, there's no fear without me only within, unless it be some sudden act of calamity to land me in the hospital again, a total wreck without memory, or worse, still behind bars. Yeah, um, to me this is, I mean, it just, um, I, I'm overflowing with admiration and identification. Um, so in my reading, um, he's both sort of insisting on and throwing away his material. He's rushing through it, but he's also committed to it. He's obviously very anxious about personal catastrophe. And the weird thing is that the things that he lists, some calamity that's going to land me behind bars or uh, in shock treatment or um, you know, other direct, are things that had already happened to him. So there's a weird temporality there. Um, he had already been institutionalized, I believe, and subjected to, to shock treatments, which left him, um, uh, I, well, f he not only lost his memory for about a year, I mean, he lost the memory of a year for the rest of his life, but he also lost all the writings that he did during that year. So it's not as if he even had the record. So there's that kind of strange temporality that I think is also mirrored by the, the, the rush and um, the, the strange emphasis, the, it's the strange emphases of the phrasing of the poem. Um, you know, these, uh, yeah, um, so, and he kind of intones these uh, shock treatments, incarceration, addictions, sexual humiliations, which really basically became um, the subject matter of his, um, of his work for the rest of his life. Um, the thing about his voice is in the Boston accent is that there's a diffidence about it and a self, um, I mean, he's both committed to what he's saying, but he's, I don't know how to describe it, he's throwing it away at the same time. Um, and we're so used to, I think, I mean, the, the typical association with the Boston accent is either this sort of tough guy, rough trade, 
Ben Affleck movies, Mystic River, tough detective, noirish, um, kind of working class, you know, a goodwill hunting, the diamond in the rough, that kind of stuff. Or the sort of on the comedy end, the car talk guys. And I would even say that um, some of Eileen Miles's charm um, and humor is, you know, it's, it, it comes through in the way she speaks, which is very unabashedly working class Boston, um, and yet showing the sort of rarefied sensibility that's also very streetwise. Um, and the thing about John Wieners is that even though he lived in close proximity with the street, and had every reason to be streetwise, he really never was. Um, and he was always running afoul of uh, not only the law, but the people with whom he had to interact in order to score, et cetera. And um, I think there's a kind of a, a tenderness and a naivete in, in his being um, that exists, that coexists alongside this extremely beautiful language um, that really, I don't know, it just challenges a lot of stereotypes. I know there's a meme on Facebook going around about the Boston accents in movies and the, the Harvard Boston accent and the Kennedy Boston accent and the Ben Affleck Boston accent and, you know, but, but John Wieners is something else. Um, so I'm thinking about sound and uh, you know this kind of wastedness of his voice and that element of working classness and how that rubs up against and caresses and kind of constitutes a very elegant and emotional poesis. So I guess that's what I had to say about, about this. Um, Thank you, Maria. Maria Damon, everyone. I love that voice. Uh, now, what's going to happen is um, for your second round, you're going to say one thing. We're going to play the clip and make one comment each. That will allow us to, yeah, I know, I'm calling an audible. Uh, <laughs> one, one reflection or comment about each with your clip, and, uh, and then we might have a few minutes for some big give and take. So, uh, yeah. Wait, can you say that again? Yeah. <laughs> So when it's your turn to yeah. speak about your second the very episode, end. Yes. play the clip and make one point. <laughs> and you're, like la you're laughing. We're running over time. You're, no. Well, no, we're doing all right, but I think this will work. Um, <laughs> Tracy <laughs> Morris, we're back to Tracy, and it's Poem Talk 76, which is Ann Waldman's to the censorious ones. Goes back to the culture wars. Tracy? Yeah, okay. Um, and you better grab that mic. We won't be able to hear you. <laughs> I have never grabbed a Man microphone before. I was going to say, yeah. nobody tells right? Tracy Morris. Okay, that is Are you direct. playing that clip ahead of time? Nobody tells Tracy Morris how to handle a microphone, but I nobody seem to be getting away with baby. it. Okay. Um, That's what you think, Al. <laughs> oh, I feel pressure. Okay. Um, I'm glad the clip is short. Go ahead, Zach. Men of war in there the plural, yeah. right? And so that is the address. So that's <laughs> that was Pierre. That was the fabulous Pierre Joris, oh. and um, that's basically what I have a lot of notes. But I will just say that in the context of this poem, the one of the things that hadn't been talked about is the use of the glissando as a musical technique in the first word of every stanza um, that Anne does. And it's specific, I think there's a reason why she's using that particular musical phrase only once in a stanza and repetition. And that the fact that it's on the I. Can you imitate? Arms, I would not disrespect Anne by trying to do a bad version. But um, since I have my computer, I can actually play a tiny bit of it because I have the mic that you made me grab. <laughs> it all works out in the end. Uh, so I'll just uh, see if I can it is remarkable. speed ahead and find it after your introduction. Uh, let's see. It might take me a second. A single day. 
Who's that? Here, every you had me to four and two committees and Waldman in Boulder, Colorado, performing open address to Senator Jesse Helms. I'm coming up out of the tomb. Okay. Yeah, that's good. He does that consistently. You can do that, though. Yeah, but I, we have Anne to do it, so I'm not going to butcher it. But um, that, that, the, 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 the musicality of that, it's so loaded, I think. She could have, and she, and the fact that she like sort of had a great deal of restraint and only using it for the first part of that contraction. She doesn't say I'm. She says I'm, and then the M is like at the end. So, what I, I'm intrigued by the use of that musical phrase and what it does. I think it it talks a lot about the depths. I think it talks a lot about the tombs. Um, I think. Um, uh, Orchid had said something about the pitch and the gendered aspect of the pitch. But I think that, and I think that I agree with all those things, but the fact that she glides from one pitch to the other means that she's indicating something about it not being gendered, that women are mm. claiming that, sens that sensory, right, and sonorous, which is actually the way that I thought of the title before I saw it written down. Um, mm -hmm that that is something that women claim all of those spaces. In other words, that this is a woman's, that this deep resonance where it starts is a woman's voice, and the pitch that it ends is a woman's voice, and that she's taking up, she's claiming all of that space as a woman's space. And you know, so that's kind of what some of my other notes were about, but mm. I'm gonna keep it to one point. Oh, that was great, thank you. <laughs> Tracy Morris on Ann Waldman. That was really great. And the aforementioned Orchid, who was part of that conversation, is here in our live audience. Let the record show. Thank you, Orchid. Uh, Steve McLaughlin is uh, taking up for his second episode, uh, Poem Talk number 33, uh, which was Sharon Mesmer's f classic flarfist poem, I Accidentally Ate Some Chicken, and Now I'm in Love with Harry Whittington. And Steve himself was a... He was on the other side of the microphone I for was, that one. I you was. were one of, and you were brilliant because you, you sort of figured it all out, as I recall. Thank you. Uh, maybe that's so, but I did talk way, way too fast. But anyway, uh, okay. So uh, just to set this up briefly. You know, one point. I'm going to keep this all brief. Um, you know, classic Bush era flarf poem filled with uh, uh, lots of images of food and uh, you know, um, um, political cast of characters. Jack Abramoff and um, Valerie Plain was in there. In any case, uh, I guess you can display the clip. Not a Gordon broke it open. But I want to propose like a third reading that's different from the two. Can you remind me of what they were? Uh, the well, nihilistic revelry and then the two. critique. Yes, yeah, so a productive critique. Productive of, critique, yeah. nihilistic revelry. I think this is a poem about compassion. Aha. Sorry to freak you out with that. <laughs> I'm freaked out. Now. <laughs> I don't know where we're going. Um, and. You know, I think everything's fair game, like, um, bring everything you know. I'm not a new critic. Bring everything you know about the poet, the person, the movement. Sharon Mesmer is a vegetarian. <laughs> Who pooed Vindaloo. Who yeah. pooed Vindaloo. Not only that, her father was a butcher. So <laughs> I think that we need to really, you know, read this poem in that light. Sounds like childhood <laughs> trauma. Childhood trauma. She has strong sort of Buddhistic leanings as well. Uh, and the titular Harry Whittington, of course, the, the guy that Dick Cheney shot in the face. Um, On a hunting trip. Yes. So this is a good example of what Poem Talk does best. It's not just a, you know, a, well, it's not just a uh, reading for its own sake. It's not just stuff, references you could look up elsewhere. Uh, it's, you know, social context. It's, it's things you can't find on Google, right? Um, just following this... Um, Alan and uh, Nada had a little disagreement about the degree to which this was a, supposed to be a political poem. Um, and uh, Al did the most Al thing, the most classically Al thing, which is that he took her point about vegetarianism and used it to support his original point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> circling back around, uh, you know, connecting it back to the critique of the neocon Republican Texas politics, which I've seen him do you know, 10,000 times in classes as a, as a student. And, uh, and it's going to be maddening if you want the topic to go somewhere else, but um, uh, he is, it's his gift. He's very good at it. It's what makes him uh, such a great teacher and uh, such a great podcast host as well. 
Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Steve McLaughlin. <clears throat> Nada Gordon has been on two poem talks, and the other was the Wallace Stevens we did. We recorded in your apartment at 92nd Street Studios or whatever it was, ah, yes. and uh, she rewrote Wallace Stevens' not ideas about the thing, but the thing itself. Not ideas about the bling, but the bling itself. And it was brilliant, and I highly recommend it. Thank you, Steve. We turn to Herman Beavers, who's looking at, he's touching a hot property here. He's looking at Poem Talk 26, which was about Vachel Lindsay's The Congo. And we had Charles and Alden Nielsen and the third person, I can't remember who it was, but it was quite something. So Herm, take it away on The Congo. So um, I, w I, I want you to know that I was really torn because Charles has a really, really great um, observation, but I went with Alden's quote because it was just so so self-contained. So if you could play the, the clip. But I'm going to reference what you said. Basic savagery is wrong. He is politically uh, correct <clears throat> in a different sense. And the, the poem goes on to present this Dantesque vision of uh, Leopold in hell for having ordered the cutting off of the hands of the workers in the Congo. So he, he clearly is taking an anti-colonialist position. Though, Definitely. His you. political position right. is clear. But what's odd is the same kind of oddity you encounter in, in reading Heart of Darkness, that he can't see a link between this racial ideology and is, again, shocked when people like Joel Spingarn and pointed out to him. He can't see a link between that and the impulses that have led to the kind of thing that Leo... Wow. Yeah, it was, it, it was a really great episode. So here's the, the thing, and, I, and, and it occurs to me that um, selecting Rukeyser and Lindsay, um, there was a kind of um, unconscious intentionality to the, to the selection, because it occurs to me, and this is really the one thing that I have to say. Um, uh, both of these poems come out of... Um, a space of critique and a space of, of anger, even, um, and, a, and a, a real sort of desire to, to critique the status quo, hence the, the reference to, to King Leopold and, and the atrocities in, in um, the Belgian Congo. But here's the thing. This is, the, the Vachel Lindsay poem is uh, a clear example of going into uh, the toolbox and coming out with the wrong tool. So, so Vachel Lindsay needs to fix his sink, and he goes in the toolbox and he gets a hammer, um, and the sink is more jacked up when he gets done than, than when he started. And, and that's, that's my way of saying, because here's where Charles' comment I think is really important. Charles talks about the fact that Lindsay is critiquing what he sees as the, the sort of sterile um, immobilized nature of white um, people's experience. And that attitude actually can be traced back to the 1830s um, in what George Fredrickson describes as um, romantic racialism, in which um, people like Harriet Beecher Stowe and her, and her father and, and people who are often abolitionists are really excited about black people because black people bring something that white people lack. And um, there are real problems with that thinking. <laughs> it's like, it, I mean, if you were to put it in gender terms, it's like saying, you know, we got to have the gals because they bring something really important to the discussion, which is totally effed up. Um, so the, the thing is, the Rukeyser poem, one, puts us into the equation, and, and, and you'll note that she talks about we. And ultimately, that's, that's kind of what the whole thing rests on, is, is, is we. Thatcher Lindsay looks at black people, and, and at no point in time does he come into the poem. And at that level, he's, not, he's, he's risking a lot, but he's not risking the right stuff. Whereas Rukeyser, risking the right stuff, because everybody's, she's saying, look, everybody's on the hot seat with me. Um, and, and so for that reason, I, I, I decided to, to do the Lindsay poem. I'm glad you did. Herman Beavers, thank you so much. Uh, 
For the record, the third poem talker that day was Michelle Taransky, who's been on a number of uh, poem talks, and she is just wonderful. Uh, we're going to turn to Billy Joe uh, in a second, but here's my little uh, commercial break. Uh, uh, when we first originally conceived of Poem Talk uh, in 2006, podcasting as we know it now was really two and a half years old. Uh, 2003, it really came into its own, and 2007, when we f first released uh, number, uh, Poem Talk number one, we were pretty much part of a new thing. Uh, and we consulted with various people who said they knew something about podcasting, Steve and I did, and some others. And they, when we told them we wanted three voices, actually four, including mine, they said, you're not doing that. That's a bad idea. You can, no one will be able to distinguish the voices. <laughs> and it's bad. No one will. They'll get, they'll get confused. And you're doing poetry, and you're doing avant-garde poetry. This is a really bad idea. You should have an interview with one person about another poet or maybe two at most, and we went ahead. And I think, proved to a lot of people, there are, um, I think, uh, there are two ways of downloading iTunes from your, uh, sorry, uh, Poem Talk from your iTunes store. One is the Poetry Foundation's, and one is ours. And there's a total of about 16 or 17,000 subscribers to the, to the episodes automatically. There are tens of thousands who hear it by downloading it directly from Jacket 2 and directly from uh, the Poetry Foundation, probably, you know, 100,000. So we're reaching a lot of people, and I've never once had any... They've complained about things, but they've never, <laughs> they've never once complained that they're confused by the voices because they think the people we invite, and the, you people are perfect examples of it, are, you know, you have something distinct to say, even if the vocal range may be similar across a couple of people. We're all so unique, and anyway, we talk to each other well. So thank you, uh, Steve, for helping me just buck that trend. Uh, do, you, would, do you remember that decision? They told us not oh, yeah. to do it. Yeah, yeah, I remember you telling me about that. Um, and you thought it was a good idea from the start or a bad idea? I can't remember. I th I, no, no, I, I was with you. I was with you. I, knew, I know you are. I'm it made teasing. editing more and more you know, difficult. It did make it that, difficult, that's yeah. That's okay. I learned yeah. after well, 20 episodes. <laughs> you did it. You did a great job. But if we listen to episode one, it's a little cringeworthy, not because the people, uh, uh, Jessica, Randall Couch, and Lindin were bad, just because I was bad and we were so stiff. It was really strange. I go back to it. Uh, William Carlos Williams. Uh, Billy Joe Harris is looking back to uh, one of my favorites, uh, the Robert Creeley, uh, I Know a Man, poem talk number 16. Billy Joe, take it away. Okay, this time, play the clip. <laughs> <laughs> one critic wrote about this poem that uh, it translates existential doubt into beat fear. <laughs> this is it characteristic of Creeley? Or is this just a chestnut anthologized poem that acts in a way the others don't? Is it characteristic of him to, to call into question the, the early Creeley, uh, anxious, uh, the darkness surrounds us guy? Okay, what's great by you cutting it down? I'll respond to the first half to, of the uh, quote and not the second because the second's really hard. Uh... I don't think that Creeley, you know, the quote basically goes that Creeley moves from existential doubt, this is the, the 60s, to beat fear. You know, and something at that moment is people were concerned about the end of the world, they were concerned about the, the atomic bomb, and so that's one way to, you know, to reduce it, to beat fear. And it seems to me um, uh, the real answer in this poem is it moves to pragmatic action. So uh, <laughs> even though the Creeley character, the Creeley persona is navel-gazing and talking on and on and on, at one important, uh, it's important that it's a dialogue, and at one point he's driving, he's talking about the universe, and uh, the passenger says, drive. For Christ's sakes, look out where you're going. And I think what's really important about that is, uh, first of all, it's a dialogue, so it's not just Creeley in his head or the persona of whatever way you want to talk about it. Uh, we get out of the head uh, by having this action, and we, we get out of the sort of art of uh, solipsistic universe. 
I guess one little more on that, but uh, I think this is the struggle that goes through uh, all the poetry, uh, this desire to get beyond. And maybe I'll read one very short poem. So we all rebel. <laughs> it's called A Token, oh, and it's Greeley. And this was going to be part of the second part of my answer. My lady fair with soft arms, what can I say to you? Words, words, as if all the world were there. OK, that's that. great, Greeley. Thank you. Billy Joe Harris, thank you so much. Charles Bernstein is uh, looking back at Poem Talk 75 about a really amazing poem by Will Alexander called Compound Hibernation. Charles. We'll play the clip first. One of the things I was hoping to talk about was his work on Haiti and voodoo um, and thinking that possession is kind of an, another important model for thinking about how he's spoken through with words and that that has um, you know, a different kind of connection to identity, right? It's not the denotative declaration of an identity, but more like embracing a particular uh, tr one strain of tradition through the African diaspora that is a way to get out of the subject, but it's a non-Western model of doing that, you know? So I think that's interesting. And um, that automatic writing and, ch and chance and, and possession are all kind of, of a piece, you know? So modernism and voodoo might have a lot more in common than we think. That's Kristen Gallagher talking. Uh, it's very hard for me in the midst of this conversation not to be primarily interested in the conversation we're having here uh, as it echoes uh, back and it reminds me that interesting conversations about poems don't have to be about the poems but can be about what comes from the poems. I was just saying to my friend Lee Jimin let's get in a goddamn big car and drive. And he said, I, I don't know how to drive. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but he's going to learn here in Philadelphia. He's just arrived for a year, and it's great to have him here at the Kelly Writers House, a visiting scholar. Look um, out where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tracy Morris say that? Is, what? Is that Maria's voice? Yeah. Right. Uh, Tracy Morris is on that episode. Um, and so I think of her, and I, I would have also used her, her clip from her, except that she's here in person. And it, I think what I have to say echoes what Tracy said before about uh, Nathaniel Mackey. And I, it, it, what, when she was speaking about it, I thought, it, you know, how much of an overlap there was between uh, Mackey and Alexander in respect to what Tracy was talking about. Uh, and, uh, and that was interesting, because I had not really thought about the two of them exactly uh, in, in that way. Um, but I guess I'm interested in the way Kristen wants to use what would seem the oracular or psychic or occult or magical language, which is also true of Helen Adam, and then combine it with the aleatoric and the chance, which would seem the opposite, and how that's such a specific space for Will Alexander, and also the space for the non-US and how it would enter in, but not as a direct transmission, but rather in the sense of possession. And so uh, I think in understanding what Will Alexander is talking about in respect to identity, this idea that the identities that we have, again reminding me of, uh, of Tracy's comment about white trauma, are, are things that we're possessed by. So you could say, well, that's not, you know, I'm not responsible uh, for Vachel Lindsay, but yet I feel I am uh, because it possesses me when I read it and it, it speaks through me and for me. I can't not speak that way, and, and, and also the same for Claude McCann, a curious uh, a way, and also for the sonnet, the way the sonnet possesses Claude McKay, um, and the way in which uh, Helen Adam also uses possession constantly in the magical themes when she's talking about the violence of gender and race relations. Thank you, Charles Bernstein. Maria Damon is looking back at Poem Talk 88, uh, one that she participated in, and boy, was that fun. We were downtown uh, at a, a, a branch of the New York Public Library. We were talking about Kathy Acker. It was before a live audience. Uh, and you were, uh, we were talking that day about two of, uh, of Janie's Persian translation poems, The Diseased and The Slave Trader, from 
uh, from Acker's book, Blood and Guts, in high school? Well, first I want to um, say, uh, Flarf rhymes with scarf. And I. <laughs> and I during this poem talk, you've knitted yeah, one. Well, no, I just mended this, which I just finished last night. Um, but it is for Sharon Mesmer, in fact. So I wanted to pass it around to gather up some nice vibes so I can bring it to her. Um, so there's that. I can't remember which clip I selected for, uh, for the Acker thing because my thinking sort of went in a different way. So we'll listen to the clip, but then I'm just going to say what I was going to say. <laughs> But she's also playing out another very typical female narrative, which is the Stockholm Syndrome, yeah. where yeah. you just fall, like the Patty Hearst narrative, right, yeah. where you fall in love with your captors. Kathy Ecker says somewhere that the kicker in Blood and Guts is that Janie's taking pleasure. Janie owns her own Stockholm Syndrome, right. even though her body's in captivity, she's, her mind is free via the writing that Al's talking about. Mm -hmm. But that reading is misinformed if it doesn't take into account the trauma of her childhood, which is incest at the hands of her father. Oh, it was perfect. It was exactly, my mind went in a circle. <laughs> anyway, one of the things that we didn't talk about at all in, or at least it, I, I don't recall and it wasn't in the finished edited version, um, was that there's a lot of mordant humor in that book. It's very funny. And in fact, what you're sort of casting as a tragedy, Al, um, this sort of incest, the, the primal trauma scene, um, is in order, and I deal with this a lot when I teach, because I teach this book, and I, I've been teaching it long since the um, phenomenon of trigger warnings, etc. And now I would, of course, say trigger warning, blah, 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 but I used to just present the book. Usually a couple people would drop out of the class. Uh, and I would teach it early on in order to sort of get rid of people who could, like if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. Um, but, but the way I've learned to teach it is that you have to think about this, you know, this suggestion of incest as, as part of a, an extremely exaggerated send up of romantic relationships in a patriarchal system that shows vi the violence alongside and intertwined with what passes for normal erotic dramas between men and women. So that the opening line, Janie lived with her, hus with her father who was also boyfriend, lover, entertainment, and money. So it's like that first sentence, you're, you're, you're kind of thrown into it. And this sort of exaggeration and the confusion of male roles and the infantilization of women um, like the the characters are called Janie and Johnny. I mean, how how much more sort of punch and Judyish can you get? Um, this sort of middle class claustrophobia of the nuclear family, the sort of grotesque vulnerability of the protagonist. She's not really a protagonist, and this is where I I really differed with you at the time. And again, you can't talk about her as you know, a 19th century character who had a youth in which something terrible happened to her and then she goes through life, you know, going through these changes. She's, she's a mashup, she's, a, she's allegorical um, for the contradictions that white middle class women and possibly others, but Janie is very specifically white, moneyed, et cetera, um, that, that they, we, live out under a patriarchal social structure. So if you read it as a kind of cartoon exaggeration, um, there's a lot of humor there that can be very, that, that is, that, you know, that makes it a lot easier to teach. You know, you're not asking your students to identify with this poor girl. You're saying, you know, watch this stick figure and see how things play out. So. Thank you, Maria Damon on Kathy Acker. I highly recommend that people listen to all 99 preceding episodes, but that one in particular, that Kathy Acker episode is really, um, I, I think if you're trying to teach Acker, uh, you really ought to listen to that. I mean, I think you can teach any of these po poets without listening to Poem Talk, but that one, was, that one I think is really, uh, 
really a primer in some ways. Um, before we turn to Erica for the last of the second round, um, I just wanted to gather a little paradise and acknowledge some people who did some extraordinary traveling uh, to come over the years to join us. Um, I remember Jerry Rothenberg, Jerome Rothenberg, coming from California to talk with us about Gertrude Stein. It was very memorable. Uh, Charles Bernstein, Pierre Joris, and Joan Retallick and I all met up at Bard College one time to talk about Jackson McClough's writing through Ezra Pound, a real memorable one. Uh, Susan Howe came for a talk about the late Stevens. She loves the late Stevens, and it's it's quite extraordinary, the poem that took the place of the mountain. Marjorie Perloff came from California one time for poem talk number 50 on Tom Rayworth, and I don't think there's a person in the world uh, except for Marjorie who can talk as fast as Tom Rayworth, and that is absolutely one to listen to. It's an extraordinary poem, and Marjorie was brilliant there. Jaap Blanc, who came from Europe uh, to talk about Bob Cobbing, and you were in on that one. And That's right. That was really quite something. Um, so at some point, I just think we all just made some noises. You know? I mean, we sort of lost the drift yeah, of it. There were noises, yep. There were some noises. Um, Ann, Ann Waldman was here and did Poem Talk 58 with us on Bernadette Mayer. Uh, and then Bernadette was here to talk uh, in, uh, for Pump Talk 85 on Jimmy Schuyler, and wow, that was great, and she was great. I think, Erica, you were in on that one, too. And Annette Debo traveled from North Carolina only to do a Pump Talk on HD's Helen in Egypt, and that's a big book, and Pump Talk doesn't do big poems very well, but I recommend that one, and we really needed Annette. There were some other great people there, but Annette really saved us that. And Alan Loney came from New Zealand for Pump Talk 20 to talk about uh, a, a Baraka poem, you were there, Herm, I think, and yes, you were, and Mecca Sullivan, and Alan said, I, I don't know anything about Baraka, are you sure this is right? And it turned out to be really right, and I recommend that. Erica Kaufman is going to conclude the round, and then I have one question for the group uh, that will lead us into a kind of an open discussion, and we'll also get a, 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 a portable mic out there if there's any questions from the audience. Um, so. Erica is going to uh, end the, the second round looking at Poem Talk 53, which was about Joan Retallick's uh, kind of procedural poem, Not a Cage. Erica. We'll start with so the recording. For me, as a digital reader now with Google Books, like the strategy of reading, like there's that desire to know mm -hmm. when you would first read this. Mm -hmm. But you can you can know now, and yeah. you, you know plugging it in and what then a reading all the pages. between 1990 and 2011. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the I think questions really change because when this when she made this um, piece, it was a question of what will happen if I do this? What coincidences will occur? What sense will be made that I cannot predict? And now you come across something like this, and the question is, where is it from? You know? Well, no, there's so many more interesting things, right? Like, there's all of the little discrete decisions that she makes. Mm -hmm. You can go back and see, like, so she quotes this whole line, but she breaks it in half. What, you know, why did she do that? And that, that's mm -hmm. really interesting. Like, why, yeah, and, I mean, even though she, like, she takes the first line of some introductions, but she cuts out some introductions entirely and starts from the first line of the prose. So there's all of these really discrete, interesting decisions so, that still... So just so you have a sense of what the procedure is that, that um, this moment is talking about. So the poem, Not a Cage, Ritalik writes, this poem is composed from beginnings and endings of books. I was calling from my library in the fall of 1990. Um, and I picked that particular moment because we're hearing Danny Snelson and Jenna Osman having a back and forth about the experience of reading a poem that's made up of language that is pulled from a myriad of different places and what happens now with technology. And right before that clip, um, Danny is saying something about, you know, how you can actually find out what all the source texts are. and. I was really taken with what Jenna Osmond was saying about how um, the impulse behind doing a project like that is really to think about um, the surprises that happen and you know what what sense could be made that you wouldn't expect to be made. And then that's a moment where I found myself thinking about the question of what's what's at stake in a poem or what's at stake in that kind of a project. And specifically, that's a question that Joan Ritalik herself asks a lot. Um, and then I was, I was thinking about the fact that when you do something where you're pulling lines from the beginnings and ends of books that you're giving away, um, there's something that happens that 
is hugely at stake, and it's something that I don't think um, I don't think is connected to whether or not you know where the sources are. So I would say that what what I'm thinking about with regards to that poem talk is the way that bringing into conversation these lines from all of these different books does something to disrupt our own reading processes. And in disrupting one's reading process, you're making room for new inquiry. You're introducing the idea that one might be able to actually productively shift your geometries of attention. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank Erica you. Kaufman, thank you so much. <laughs> the poem had been written prior to our ability to track down all of the references. So she was throwing books out and thinking no one will ever know where these are from. But in fact, Danny comes along and figures it all out. And Jenna is a little bit uncomfortable with this. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just, can I say one last yes, please. anecdotal thing? Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the amazing pleasure of helping Joan go through her library at her office when she was moving out of her office on campus. So I saw you should have done a film that of this. process, and um, you know, there's a moment in in the episode where it's a question of does she feel guilty, and um, you know, it's it's interesting to think about digital books, but just you know, spending a lot of time with Joan and and watching her look at every book, um, <sighs> and just kind of like sighing about yeah, throwing them out. It was yeah. awesome. Yeah. So. So I want to ask a question after I make an observation. Um, and Herm, you sit, sit back a little bit so I can see Maria, because I want to just have a, if you don't mind, sorry. I just want to see if we can open this up. So anybody chime in in response to this question. The observation I want to make is a, a, a bit, it starts with self-criticism, and then unfortunately it goes to you know great praise, self-praise. <laughs> but really what it's about is uh, something that, I th that Steve directly spoke about in his discussion about Lynn, Lynn Din's response, and somebody else Else, perhaps Charles, about the or and and Herm too, in response to the Rukeyser conversation, um, about how the poetry community, which can get very sectarian, can come around when you invite them to hang out around a poem, sort of a third object, an extra object, and uh, this was sort of the dis the delight of your rediscovering Rukeyser in this thing. Um, and so I began poem talk gathering people around who were more or less experts about the poem we had chosen. In fact, in some cases, when I w I'll, I'll concede that when I was dealing with an eminent person whose time was very, you know, spare, who had, had to really move fast and really wanted to get this thing done and make it good, I would actually defer and say, what, would, what poem would you like to do? Or what poet? And then I'll find something. Not in all cases, but in a lot of cases. And I kept, at the beginning, building poem talks around a group of like people. Um, I gave an example a few minutes ago of um, Alan Loney. He was visiting on a day we were doing Baraka. He knew nothing about Baraka. And he was game. And he wound up being contributing mightily to the conversation, I think. Um, and I think as poem talk grew and emerged into the 50s and 60s of its uh, episode numbers, we began to build uh, unusual combination, interesting and maybe counterintuitive combinations of people. Uh, and I began as a curator of this thing to get tremendous pleasure in creating fresh convergences. And I think I'm taking more pleasure in that than ever before. So I want to just draw an example from an upcoming poem talk and then ask any of you to speak, not specifically to the poem talk process, um, but to this idea that the poetry world can be through some kind of formalistic structure like this, that people from all parts of the poetry world can be brought to bear together and wind up actually agreeing quite a lot in a way that they maybe aren't agreeing when the topic is general rather than a single poem, if you know what I mean. I'd love to hear all of you on this topic. The example I want to give is upcoming episode number 102, uh, two after this. And I'm hosting the Canadian rock star lyricist guitarist Andrew Whiteman, uh, Broken Social Scene is this one of his bands. And Whiteman is a great fan of Mod Poe, The Open Course, and also of Poem Talk. And so he sort of sought me out. I mean, like I'm starstruck when he's around, but he's actually, to be, to be honest, hello, Andrew, I know you're listening to this. You know, he came on one of his tours to he sort of 
left Pittsburgh or something to come and meet me and talk about poem talk. And I finally persuaded him to do a poem talk himself. So he's coming to do a performance here and then he'll be here. And he wanted to talk about Ed Dorn. Uh, I didn't know what to do with that. I still don't, but I found a really great, great poem, which you'll wait till 102 to, to hear about. And then I went, I cast about for two other people, and I called Sophia Lafraga, someone I never, have never met, but I've seen her perform. She's quite extraordinary. And she's not what I would consider someone who's naturally going to speak. She's not speaking the Dorn vocabulary, let's just say that. Um, and she, she, by this point, poem talk is admired enough uh, even, I would say, by that generation, a young generation, Sophia's generation, so that she said, okay, if you're going to talk about Dorn, I think this is going to be a, a safe space, and I think we can do that. Let's do it. And then um, I spoke with uh, Simone White, who hasn't been on Poem Talk and whose poetry I admire. And, uh, and she's also not someone who's that familiar with Dorn and was game. And so the Canadian rock star... Uh, Andrew Whiteman, Sophia Lafraga, and Simone White will gather to talk about Ed Dorn, and there isn't a Dornian in the room, and I'm really proud of that, but I wonder if it means anything. Should I be proud of that? Uh, is this a model for, that's a leading question, isn't it? Should I be proud of it? <laughs> is this a model for the kind of conversation we can have across the sectarianism of poetry as we know it today? A wide open question, but at least it's focused. Maria, your thought? Oi. Um, the first thing that occurred to me um, when, when you, when, yeah, was that this is actually the new critical model. You know, you come together with, for an hour or so, with one object, you kind of leave your differences at the door or bring them with you, but channel them through, um, you know, through a formal discussion or a discussion of the formal properties of a poem. And um, we all know that new criticism, while it has its beauties, also has itself um, been raked over the coals because of its sort of false decontextualizations. And false democracy. Right. So um, I, I, I love poem talk. I love participating. I love listening. But I don't know if it's genuinely a panacea for the ills that are plaguing the poetry <laughs> world. And I don't even necessarily, in the big picture, think that those ills are necessarily so ill. They're uncomfortable, they're excruciating, they're painful, um, but this is the way it goes. Steve? Yeah, well, you can imagine a thousand ways that would, that would go wrong. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, I, but I'm sure it, it, you'll, you'll rein it in, it'll be fine. Um, you mean the Dorn thing? The Dorn thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that grouping of people. Um, I don't mean it isn't really a pure new critical um, uh, process. People do their homework ahead of time and they, they bring something. Um, and then, you know, really the, the, the first step is for Al to come, come forward with something that's, I, sometimes I wonder if you um, do this intentionally, but you have a reading that's uh, too rigid. I mean, I, like, I feel like you're maybe, you, I, I mean, you probably believe it, but, uh, but, but you're giving some people something to, to push back against or at least to get the conversation started. And that, I'm, I'm sure that'll go somewhere good. Tracy, your thoughts on this in general? Uh, I agree with Steve. Um, I think that you're kind of understating the, the, the aspects of the mechanics that make it successful besides getting people together to filter through a poem. And a lot of that has to do with you. And the fact that you I have an exhaustive amount of knowledge, and I feel like, I'm, I feel like you're always holding back like you could easily dominate the discussion. And because people get a sense that you have a great wealth of knowledge, but that you're not, but that there's something more important to talk about than showing what you know, it creates this environment. And that does not always happen because we're all very passionate about 
what we are doing. I think the fact that it's in this space, it's a welcome, nurturing space has something to do with it. The professionalism of the technical folks, or things that you, you know that you don't generally have to think about when you have to, you know, when you go to do an interview, you go to discuss poetry, and before you interject to either be self-effacing or to talk about something else, I'm just. I was about to do that. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, you know, this is the, these are the aspects of it that actually make it work. This is like the technical aspects of it that make poem talk successful. So you can't, like, you can't be self-effacing because then you won't let me answer your question. And I'm trying to answer your question. <laughs> I'm not trying to be nice, okay? <laughs> but you are being nice, thank you. Well, I'm, I wouldn't come if I didn't actually believe that. So I'm just saying that if those elements aren't in place, then it would be harder for it to work, and so it's harder to make a generalization mm -hmm. about it question for Charles and Erica. Is the formalism of it, as Maria is referring to it correctly, is the formalism of it disarming? Is it possible that the formalism of it and the focus on that object, um, one of the ways where we check our partisanships or check our, um, uh, our sometimes aggressive feelings about the poet or poem, I think that happened in the uh, Congo episode, uh, does that succeed? A return to formalism as a kind of liberation from all the historicisms that have made it very difficult for us to be free to get into a poem. Thoughts, Erica, <laughs> Charles? I think it would have been a problem to do that with uh, the Congo. I think you needed to have people who could address the problem and had thought about it, so there would be a counterexample. I think that uh, I was also going to say, I don't remember my Bible exactly, but Pride cometh before the fall. Fall. Say two Corinthians. Fall. So, <laughs> oh, it's because it was that later one. I don't know the later. But I would say that that would be good if you had poem talk that was post-fall. That would be something I could get behind. I I I think that when we uh, occasionally it comes up that this would be good in the class because to some of us anyway, and maybe all our our college teachers of poetry, it's a very specific uh, and in, really kind of insane occupation. Uh, but it, 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 we think this would be good in a class. I, I, I think poem talk is okay in a class, but if you're going to have a class, you don't need poem talk as much. I think poem talk is primarily valuable for people who are not having classes, who want to hear that discussion. And in that sense, I think structurally, uh, the technique that you're talking about mimes the situation in the classroom, which I'm sure will shock the millions of viewers out there of poem talk, that here, even at the University of Pennsylvania, very few people have heard or read any of the poets I have ever taught. They're always coming to it for the first time and saying things like, I didn't know about that. And uh, because poetry is not part of their education, no matter how well educated they are. So I think what you, we become sort of adept at the myth of Sisyphus, that every year we start out again with this uh, um, relative lack, not of reading skills, but of specific knowledge about poems. And so you're relying on the fact that a thoughtful reader can come up with reading poems without having to have that knowledge because it's the expertise that seems to uh, make people feel that they can't read poems. And I think all of, I, I certainly would strongly say you don't need to know anything to read a poem. You start to read it and then you have responses. So I think that you mime that. There's also the case that there's always a ringer or two ringers, even in the one that you're talking about coming up. There's two people who know about Ed Dorn and who are interested in it. So it isn't as if nobody has done it. In my seminar once, you did something where everybody read a poem graduate seminar that they had never uh, seen before and you didn't explain what it was. You either just played yes. the sound. Did they like that? Yeah, I thought it was very good for that group because it sort That's of throws you off. That's different from whether they liked it. Uh, did they? Did the, did the people participating? Yes, I, I think. I came in with a really old-fashioned pedagogy. I right. asked them to look at poems that they didn't know anything about, and then and I gave them no contextual information. And, and you had a term for that too, which was good. What was it? Fast reading? First first reading? First reading. First yeah. reading. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's very good because I think it it it, it the, the problem with acad for academics and graduate students is that their knowledge often is the greatest impediment to their reading poems. They do third readings and slow readings, not fast readings. Yeah. Um, Erica, your thoughts on any of this? Yeah, I have two thoughts. One is um, to build on, I guess, what Tracy was saying before. I think that for me, um, one of the things that makes poem talk what it is is that um, 
you know how to ask good questions, and you, oh, thank you. know how this to. This is fun. How to push? <laughs> well, see, as as somebody who thinks about teaching all the time, it's really really hard to figure out a way to ask a question that will get the person that you're asking to take a risk in their thinking. And I feel like that's how, at least in my experience, that's something that happens to me when I'm doing poem talk, because when you're focusing so intently on a specific poem, and whether or not you're familiar with it, there's something that can happen in that space of deep attention um, that then gets pushed even further if you're asked a kind of a good question. And then to follow up to what... And the bad questions are all edited out. <laughs> they aren't, actually, but are they? I don't know. We've done a few, maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, it's hard having you here, Steve. You know everything. Um, but, I mean, there are times where I left Poem Talk having a different reading of a poem that I went in thinking that I really understood or, or that I really felt comfortable with. And um, to follow up on what Charles was saying around the formalism of the podcast, I think that for secondary school teachers, one of the great things is that because podcast is now a recognizable form, poem talk almost models a different way of thinking about the pedagogy of close reading. Mm -hmm. And it models it in a way that's accessible to younger students, but also to teachers of all different places and grade levels and all that kind of stuff. Cool. I mean, uh, close reading is been so out of favor for so long as a term that teachers who are finding the podcast don't even think of it as a form of new criticism, I suppose. Um, Herman and Billy Joe, your thoughts on any of this stuff we've been talking about? Well, you know, as, as Tracy was talking, I was thinking about um, the fact that um, I've been reading about um, jazz musicians' uh, fake books. Oh, yeah. And um, if you've never heard that, that phrase, a fake book is usually an older musician's um, arrangement of, of all kind of songs and the way that he, like, he or she likes to play them. Um, and younger musicians want to get their hands on them because um, they want to say, well, you know, I want to know how Red Garland plays this riff in this sort of pop song. Well, poem talk is kind of an instance where you ask us to come with our, with our fake books. <laughs> um, and... Uh, I'm taking piano lessons, so, so forgive me. Um, uh, you ask us to play tenths instead of sixth. Six, you know, we're, we're comfortable playing six, but you've got to reach and do that Oscar Peterson tenth. Big hands. Um, it's, 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 you come out of the experience really um, energized. Because some of these poems I know, and some of them I, I, I don't. I mean, the, the last poem talk that I did was... Um, was um, uh, James Weldon Johnson, and I, and I knew that poem pretty well, but um, I really felt like, uh, in a way that reminds me of Duke Ellington, you orchestrated um, a, a conversation that, that went to places that, that none of us expected, I think. I had no idea where we were going with that, and it's, uh, I, we haven't released that yet, so it's, it's coming out soon. Thank you, Herm. Um, Billy Joe, any thoughts yeah, on I, uh, this? I have several, but I'll keep, uh, keep them down. One calling this a formal, uh, you know, program over and over. There's certainly, you know, there, you're certainly looking at the forms of poems. But something I found really valuable is the historical context, which we need. If you're reading like when we were reading, uh, if we, uh, if we must die. I mean, you know, people have to. You have to know his, the historical moment was written, in, and people bring that in, and they bring it in very, I mean. I, very gracefully, uh, which sort of m moves to the second thing, which is the um, uh, throwing out the experts, that model. Uh, I think it's swell to have people who read poetry who, who aren't necessarily an expert on the poet because that, because that, you know, they do get into their routine. They do get into their fake book. Uh, but I do always find, I mean, something I find really good about poem talks, there are people who have deep knowledge about poets and they, ex they express that deep knowledge. Um, I think um, uh, the statement about uh, the class really isn't the place to listen to poem talk, but the place to listen to poem talk is, is uh, on your own, I think is absolutely so. And I wasn't involved in this class. 
a, a, a brilliant class. I mean, people who were so articulate and so wonderful. And uh, a, a distinguished uh, poet came in, and she said, um, I really think poem talk is important. And she played three episodes. And it killed the class mm. because it was just, they didn't have to have any thoughts or anything. It was all formulated. And it's a very different situation. Okay, yeah. and my, the, the last uh, uh, thought is uh, I'm very fond of, of, of poem talk and listening to it. And, and what is it and what is terrific about it? There are lots of things, but there are people talking about poems very carefully and also unpretentiously. And I don't think it really matters that they agree or not. But I think that it works as an incredible example for, you know, here, here's somebody who doesn't know anything about poetry, and here are people who t are talking about these poems impassionately for mm -hmm. a half an hour or so. Thank you, Billy Joe. Uh, I, I think that um, we will uh, link to the Poem Talk uh, program note for this Poem Talk something that Erica or Erica and I can work on, which would be maybe a guide to teachers who would use Poem Talk in the classroom. Because clearly the thing to do is not to take your 90 minutes and play three episodes back to back of Poem Talk. <laughs> but, I, but I think Erica and I, which, and we've talked about this at great length, the idea is to do, th it's 30 minutes and you typically have 50 or 110 minutes in a classroom. You play it for 30 after they've studied the poem the night before and then you've got the rest of the time to talk. Um, so you, and also I like to think that the 100 episodes form a kind of uh, mishmash syllabus and you've got 3,000 minutes of people talking about these poems and all the texts and so it's kind of its own anthology. Well that's all the poetic fake books we have time for on <laughs> Poem Talk today. Again, Poem Talk at the Writers House, a collaboration of the Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing, Penn Sound, and the Kelly Writers House at the University of Pennsylvania and the Poetry Foundation, poetryfoundation.org. Thanks to my guests, Maria Damon, William J. Harris, Tracy Morris, Herman Beavers, Charles Bernstein, Erica Kaufman, and Steve McLaughlin and to Poem Talk's director and engineer today, Zach Cardner. And to Poem Talk's current contemporary editor, the same Zach Cardner, with a special thanks once again to Steve McLaughlin, who edited Poem Talk from the beginning and through the first 75 episodes. To Poem Talk's audience over the past nine years, we thank you for listening and for reaching out to us pretty often to commend our approach or sometimes to tell us what we didn't do so well. To staff of the Writers' House and CPCW, we thank you for putting up with a parade of poem talking poets tromping through my third floor office for many years and now the Wexler Studio. To our colleagues at the Poetry Foundation who have supported us and also it should be noted, of course, given us complete freedom to choose poets and poems. And tonight to a wonderful audience for joining us through this special event and I'll ask you, audience, once again to put your hands together to thank our returning poem talkers once again as I say their names, Maria Damon, <laughs> William J. Harris, Tracy Morris, Herman Beavers, Charles Bernstein, Erica Kaufman, and Steve McLaughlin. This is Al Filrys, and I hope you'll join us. You're welcome. Yeah, this is that. Al Filrys, and I hope you'll join us again next month for episode number 101 of Poem Talk. Ooh.